Praise God. Pentecost Sunday. This is a time we recognize, and we ought to, Pentecost Sunday ought to be recognized all the time. We never need to forget of the outpouring, the glory, and the presence of God. Amen. Amen. Brother Jack was preaching this morning, teaching this morning in a devotion, doing an excellent job. Are you ready for the word this morning? Amen. Brother Jack was sharing in, about Indiana Jones. How many of you ever saw the movie Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade? Oh, good. I'm glad there's more than three hands. I was up in Sand Mountain, and I was ministering to a men's retreat up there with Pastor Stone. And I said to the men, how many of you have seen, remember the movie Indiana Jones, The Last Crusade? And it was out of 26, 25 people, three of them raised their hand. So I guess that's an older movie than I have to realize and I have to admit. But Jack talked about that movie today and, and how... And I heard that they showed it yesterday. It was, it was showing yesterday. And, and Harrison Ford, Indiana Jones, he was going to walk by faith. He had to walk by faith. And he stepped his foot out like I'm stepping it out right now. And, and when he stepped his foot out by faith, it hit. The, the walkway was there because he believed God. Then he reached back and he took some sand and he threw it out there. And as he threw it out, you could see the walkway that went all the way into the place where he was going to go and get the Holy Grail. And when, when he got close to that, uh, his dad was the one that was studied all his life about the grail and about, uh, about what it took and about the anointing. And, 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 he, got, and he, got, uh, he got shot. He was laying there bleeding, his, uh, Indy's dad. And, 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 and he, he started, Indy had to go through uh, these certain things to get to the place where he needed to go. And he reached down. He told his dad, Dad, tell me again what I need to do. And here's what his dad said. If you're going to get to the place where you need to be, you need to be a penitent man. And then he said you need to kneel before God. These are some great principles, I think. And then he, he said you need to know the word of God. And you need to understand the name of God. And he said the path of God. And he said you're going to have to make a leap of faith. And you're going to have to believe. You're going to have to believe and choose wisely. Choose wisely. And you ever remember the story? He went into the he went to the place where the Holy Grail, and there was an old knight that was there for 250 years guarding the Grail. And and the and the and the man that was selfish and was just after himself, he tried, he got in there too, and, and he said, I'll get it, I'll get it. He went and he grabbed the most prettiest grail that was on the table, gold and in line. And, and he took the water and he drank it, and as he did, his face melted. And the old knight said, he chose poorly. <laughs> and so Indy went over and he looked at the whole table full of grails, full of cups. And there was one that looked like a carpenter might have made of it. It was carved out of wood. It was just an old wooden, it was just an old wooden soup bowl looking a cup. And he reached over and he grabbed that cup and stood for a minute trying to make sure it was the right decision. Filled it with water and drank it. And the old knight said, he chose wisely. <laughs> As we come to Pentecost, realizing that you made a wise decision to trust God. You made a wise decision when you put your hand in the nail-scarred hand of Jesus and made him Lord of your life. I'm sure God was up in the throne room somewhere when you accepted Jesus. And he said, you chose wisely. I can hear it, can't you? There's ten things that you should know about Pentecost Sunday. Number one, Pentecost Sunday marks the day when the Holy Spirit descended upon the apostles, descended upon those that were waiting in the upper room, descended upon those on last, last Thursday night. I ministered on the theme, the preparation for Pentecost. How many of you know if any good thing's going to happen in your life, there's going to have to be some preparation? You have to prepare for it. And there was those 120, which means about 380 weren't, didn't show up. They were no-shows. Because it says in 1 Corinthians 15, it's 500 saw him at one time after the resurrection. So 120 gathered because they were the remnant. How many of you know God's always going to have a remnant? 
always going to have a, 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 a group of people, not the multitudes and not the everybody's and not all the ones that gathered uh, for the fishes and the loaves, not those, but the ones that care and have a passion for the things of God, those that want the power of God in their life and those that will pay the price. Pentecost Sunday occurs 50 days after Easter. The Bible records Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 and verse 1 through 3. We're going to get there in a few moments. The fourth thing, Pentecost comes 10 days after the ascension of Jesus. Remember, he was here for 40 days. From the time he resurrected, he ministered to 40 days. There was many of those that met him on the road and he spoke to and he appeared in the upper room when they was in prayer and just came through the, uh, through the end of the room and all the walls were closed and the doors were closed and, and they were shut up in there. Jesus appeared in the glorified body. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus ascended into heaven and he told his disciples before he ascended, he said, Terry, here in Jerusalem, till the Holy Ghost comes upon you that you might be witnesses Jerusalem Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world. He commissioned them. Pentecost is also known as the birthday of the church. The church was birthed on Pentecost. The fulfillment of that is found in Isaiah chapter 54. Isaiah 53, I call it the fifth gospel. He was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. Chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. But then Isaiah 54 is the beginning of the church dispensation. Isaiah said, stretch out your tent pegs, make room. Sing, O barren woman, sing. The barren church that didn't have power, the barren church that didn't have the anointing yet, the barren church that didn't have the Holy Ghost, he said, stretch out your tent pegs and make room for the anointing of God. This barren woman is going to be filled with the glory and the presence and the power. It was the birthday of the church and the commissioning of the church. When the church was birthed, Jesus commissioned the disciples to tear in Jerusalem that they might be empowered to change lives. They might be empowered to be a witness. They might be empowered to be light and to be salt. We weren't saved just to sit around in our, in, in our, in our own little circles and say how good it is. Church, we weren't saved just to be able to say, I'm going to go to heaven. We were saved and empowered by the Holy Spirit that we might be a vessel that reaches out to other people, that changes somebody's life, that sees somebody hurting and broken and heals them, that somebody might know and be encouraged because there's something inside of us that's bigger than we are. We shouldn't even be a church member or we shouldn't come to the house of God or we shouldn't find relationships just to see what we can receive. There ought to be something within us that wants to give. There ought to be something in us that wants to go further than where we are. That we want to extend ourselves into somebody's life so somebody's life can be changed. It was, the, it was the birthday of the church. Pentecost fulfills Jesus' promise to send the counselor, the comforter, the paraclete, the one that would pull up alongside and Jesus said, I'm going to leave you, but I'm not going to leave you comfortless. The Holy Spirit will come. The Spirit of truth is found in John 16, 5 through 15. The Spirit of truth will come. It was the promise from the Father. The seventh thing is Pentecost launches the large scale, spreading the gospel after Jesus ascended. The purpose wasn't just to sit around in the, in, in, in the home and have home groups. They did that. Acts chapter 2 said they went from home to house to house breaking bread. That was a good thing. It said, in fact, they communed together, and those that didn't have uh, were met by those, those that had sold so they could meet the needs of the ones that they, they had. They found great fellowship. And they did that for eight chapters in the, in the book. The Bible in, in, in Acts 1.8 says stay here in Jerusalem. But in Acts 8.1, it said great persecution came upon them and scattered them to Samaria, Judea, and the uttermost parts of the world. God said, if, you, if you're not going to move out on your own, I'll give you a little bump. If you're just going to sit around and enjoy, I'm going to give you a little push. I'm going to encourage you. Do you ever encourage your children to do something? We called it encouragement, but we also said you better do it. 
And the Lord worked it out that the disciples went out and they started ministering the gospel and preaching the kingdom of God and ministering. They launched a scale, uh, they, they launched a evangelistic outreach and they touched lives because of what they were doing. And in Acts 2.41, it records that after Peter spoke to the crowd, after receiving the Holy Spirit, 300 people were saved and baptized. I mean, 3,000 people were saved and baptized. 3,000 people gave their heart to the Lord. That was the beginning of the church. And people have been giving their heart to the Lord and lives have been changed ever since. Pentecostal movement derives the name from the New Testament in Acts chapter 2 called Pentecost. We're known as Pentecostal people. Did you know that? As Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost filled, water baptized, Jesus on my mind. We're called Pentecostal people. We have a reputation of being Pentecostal people. Pentecostal people uh, wait upon the Lord and the Holy Ghost comes. But I'm really concerned about Pentecostal people in this generation that we live. It used to be you'd go to a Pentecostal church and the glory would fall. And back in the days in the outpouring of the Spirit. I remember back in the early 70s, it was called, a, it was called a, the Holy Spirit renewal. And God would move and people would leave uh, the denominational churches just to come and get under the flow and get into the glory of God but we've got sophisticated but we've got modern a lot of the churches won't, won't even let anybody speak a message today or give a word from the Lord or, or, or have a prophetic word or, or sing in the Spirit because they don't have time. We need to make time to allow the Holy Ghost to move. We need time for the Spirit of God to flow in the house. We need time for God to speak to us. Jesus also celebrated Pentecost, but not for the same reason. Or the, I'm sorry, the Jews also celebrated Pentecost, not for the same reason as Christians do. The celebration by the Jews of Pentecost is to observe God's giving of the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. It was 50 days from the time that they walked across the Red Sea to the time that Moses went to the mountain in Exodus. The Pentecost... In Pentecost, the Jews' Jewish tradition was to take place 50 days after Passover. 50 days after Passover in, in Exodus is when they gave the, the wheat offering and the, the, the harvest of the wheat. And that was thanking God for the harvest and thanking God for the goodness. And they called it Shabbat. In the Western church, Pentecost is usually represented with the color red. I'm wearing red today because Pentecost, it's a symbolizing the fire that fell. Red symbolizes the fire, the cloven tongues of fire that fell upon them on Pentecost. And so many of the Western churches on Pentecost, they wear red to recognize that event. Acts chapter 2, I'm just giving you a little rundown, I'm just giving you a little brief, is that all right? Acts chapter 2. Let's look at the Word of God and we're going to flow through this Pentecost experience that is very, very close to my heart. In Acts chapter 2, bring you up to date, there were 120 that waited in the upper room. A lot of times we want to know who are those 120 people. It mentions the disciples. It mentions the mother of Jesus and some of the women that were there. I had to follow Jesus from Calvary to the Ascension. But I think there were some other people there in the upper room waiting on the outpouring. I believe if we go through the Gospels, we could probably figure out who some of them would be. The woman with the issue of blood, I think she was there. She was healed, remember? That one leopard that came back. And gave thanks when the other nine left. I think that leopard was probably there. He wasn't a leopard anymore. He was healed. I think blind Bartimaeus was there. I think the mother and her son that was on the road to the city called Nain when Jesus came and healed and raised up her son from the dead. It was a funeral procession. 
I think they were there. I think the woman that was taken in adultery. And Jesus said to her, where are your accusers? And he said, those without sin cast the first stone. And one by one, those religious men. My feeling is they all might have been involved with her. They were accusing her. But the thing is, they, they were really not after her. That wasn't the issue. They was trying to trap Jesus. I bet she was there, waiting in the upper room, praying and seeking God. We can just walk through the word. Probably those two men on the road to Emmaus, they were there. Many of those that were gathered around the cross when Jesus was crucified and wept because they loved him and they had seen his ministry and they were empowered by him. They might have been there. But the important thing is, when they gathered there, they had to come to a place of oneness. It says in Acts chapter 2 and verse 1, when the day of Pentecost, there was a day called Pentecost. That was on the 50th day, 50 days after the resurrection. On the day of Pentecost, had fully come. They were all in one accord. Can you imagine bringing 120 people in one accord? Can you imagine getting 120 people thinking the same, on the same mind, on the same page? When it was come time for them to pray, and I'm sure they prayed a lot, everybody got into prayer together and it sounded as one voice. When they, I'm sure when they started talking at the beginning of those 10 days in the upper room, they started talking about different things, sharing their testimony, sharing how Jesus touched their life, how he empowered them, and, 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 and how they knew that he was the Messiah. Remember, most of the people in the early church were Jewish people. Do you know that? I think sometimes we think it was a church like we have, all Gentiles, maybe a few Jewish people. No, the whole church was, most of the church was built on, uh, on Jewish people that were, uh, that were recognizing the power of God and recognizing who Jesus was. Somebody with me? There had to be some of that coming together. But it says they were all, not a few, not some, they were in one accord. And next thing is they was in one place. Church, there's a time we need to come to one place and worship him. It's important to come to the house of God. We live in a generation where people are going to let their uh, brother wonderful that's on the computer be their, be their pastor. Or brother wonderful over in Texas or brother wonderful in wherever going to watch television because it can be real quick. We can get a 30-minute sermonette and we can jump into our, in, into our uh, golf clothes or we can jump into our fishing boat and we can go do our thing. We feel like we had church. But the scripture says that they were in one accord in one place. Gathered in the presence of God to come under his anointing and receive the word of the Lord and be empowered by his presence and by his anointing. We must be in the right place if we're going to get the right anointing, if we're going to have the right touch, if we're going to receive what God has. I'm going to tell you something. God bless all of you. You're in the right place this morning. My pastor always says there's no other place anywhere around this place that's anything like this place, so this must be the place. Brother Curry, you heard pastor say that when we was up in the mountain. He said that for years and years. This is the place. Acts chapter 2 and verse 2, and suddenly, suddenly, sometimes, sometimes in the anointing, suddenly is what happens. And some people will miss it if you're not there because it suddenly happens. I have a sermon and I've titled it, The Man That Missed the Moment. Jesus appears to the, uh, to the disciples on Sunday night after the resurrection. Resurrection is at 6 o'clock or after 6 o'clock on Sunday morning. Early in the morning, he's the resurrection. The angels, I'm sure, moved the rock out of the way and Jesus comes out of the tomb. And then that Sunday night, he's already concerned about spending time with his disciples and ministering them. He shows up. And the man that missed a moment was Thomas. He wasn't there. Sunday night, Probably daylight savings time. 
Got plenty of light to mow the grass. Plenty of time to go out and, 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 and till the garden. Maybe you watch our favorite television program Sunday night. Thomas missed the moment. Jesus showed up. Thomas wasn't there. Aren't you glad he's a, he, he gave Thomas a second chance? We don't want to be the person that misses the moment. Amen? So and suddenly there came a sound from heaven. I would have liked to have been there. I would have liked to have been there. Now, there are some people that have said, Pastor, don't you wish we would have lived back in, in, in Jesus' day? Don't you live, we, wish we could have lived back in the days of the Apostle Paul and traveled his missionary journeys? Don't you wish we could have been there in, in Pentecost? I've never had that desire to be there. I'm glad I'm here right now where I'm supposed to be under the anointing of God in the place that I'm at. I'm called and anointed and appointed for what we're doing today. But I would have liked to heard that sound. Oh, my goodness, that sound, Dr. Seymour. If it, was, it had to be a sound that was so different that they wrote it and they penned it and they put it in the Word. It said, and suddenly, this wasn't a drawn-out thing. This wasn't like, well, maybe we're hearing a little of that now. It's going to get a little louder. No, no, no. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven. The sound was like a Russian mighty wind. I've heard people say the Holy Spirit is a Russian mighty wind. He's not. The Holy Spirit is not a Russian mighty wind. It says it sounded like a Russian mighty wind. Are you with me? It's kind of like when people say, uh, say, what did it sound like when a tornado comes through? And they'll say, it sounded like a freight train. Has anybody ever heard that? But how many of you know a tornado is not a freight train? Am I right? Every time I've ever heard, I've heard on, on television, people report, what did it sound like? A tornado sounded like a freight train, but it's not a freight train, but it was a wind that was coming through with so much power that it made the noise that sounded like a freight train. Now, there was the noise like a mighty Russian wind, like a wind blowing through with power, like, uh, like a, a wind. But it wasn't a wind, but it sounded like it. And then it filled the whole house. It filled the whole house. The glory of God filled the house. The presence of God came in. It must have been something like it, it, like it happened over in Isaiah 6-1 in the year that uh, uh, King Uzziah died. Uh, Isaiah said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up and his train filled the temple and the glory filled the place. It said, and the doorpost shook and the foundation shook uh, with the power of God. It must have been something like that. Can you imagine? It filled the house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them different or divided or cloven Whatever translation you're reading, cloven tongues or divided tongues or, or, or tongues of fire. That's where the red comes in. Tongues of as of fire. Now, is the Holy Ghost fire? No, as of fire. That's how they recognize it came in with that kind of demonstration. And one set upon each of them. The fire. Now, listen. There was 120 in the upper room, and every one of them had the fire like uh, of anointing fall on them that they knew the Holy Spirit was there. Are you with me, church? And it set upon them 120 tongues of fire. 120 anointed tongues of fire came upon them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The, the, the speaking in tongues is part, of the, is part of the power that comes when we receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. When the Spirit of God falls on us, uh, these, uh, the cloven tongues of fire and the Holy Ghost uh, impartation and tongues could will be part of what you've experienced. You may not experience right away. Because of our traditions, my tradition held me back for about six months because of what I was taught previously. Sometimes we have, to, we have to purge out some of the things that we've been taught to be able to allow the freshness of the Spirit of God flow through us. Is anybody with me on that? I was, I was involved in a church that said, this is not for today. The power of God isn't for today. There's no apostles today. There's no prophets today. I said, why not? It's all in the Bible. So they took me over to 1 Corinthians 13 and said, and said uh, that, that uh, when, uh, when the fullness of Jesus comes, this will be done away with. 
And they said the Bible is completed from when Revelation was completed. All these things are done away and it didn't make any sense to me. But it was saying now we look through a looking glass darkly but one day face to face with him we'll know all things even as we're known. That's when we enter into the heavenlies. That's when we're in his presence. That's when we move from this dimension to that. As long as we're here on this earth there's going to be the power of God. We need the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. We need, we need the five-fold ministry operating. We need apostles and we need prophets and we need to be able to speak in tongues and interpret and move in the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Lord. You see, we need, to, we need to understand God's power. And they begin to speak with other tongues. Verse 5, And there were dwelt in Jerusalem devout men from every nation under heaven. And when the sound occurred and the multitude came together, uh, they were confused because everyone heard what was spoken in their own language. Many times the gift of tongues will be a communications for those that don't understand. And as they were speaking in tongues, 20, 120 people speaking in tongues, some of them were speaking in different languages, and those that were gathered from all over the, uh, all over the region were hearing their own languages. And the Bible goes on to explain all the different ones that were there, all the different languages necessary, all the different ones that were heard. They were hearing something coming out of that upper room that they could understand their own language. And it was God's way of saying, I've showed up. God's way of saying, I'm here. I'm for real. And they heard this glorious thing. And it said that they were speaking in verse 11, speaking in their own language, the wonderful works of God. What was being spoken? The wonderful works of God. What was they hearing? The blessings and the anointing of God. Through the, through the power of the Holy Spirit, this outpouring of the Holy Spirit, they was hearing the wonderful works of God. Hallelujah. In verse 12 says, they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? What could this mean? What is this? We saw these cloven tongues of fire sitting on the heads of 120 people, and then all of a sudden they start speaking in, the, in, our, in our language, and we could understand what they were saying, the wonderful works of God. How could this be? It had to be a witness. It had to be a, a, a life-changing experience. That's the reason why 3,000 got saved that day, because the anointing fell and the blessings of God fell. Signs and wonders were in that place, and God used the power of the Holy Spirit to change lives. Of course, there's always going to be mockers. There's always going to be somebody say, I don't care about this. I don't believe this. There's always going to be somebody that's going to mock, scoff, laugh. Always. There always will and there always, there always going to be until, until Jesus comes. Because it says in verse 13, others mocking said, they're filled with new wine. They must have got drunk early. They must have got up early and started drinking. After all, this was only 9 o'clock in the morning. Are you with me, church? They said, man, they must have been hitting the bottle early this morning. But Peter stood up. Peter stood up, and he started to speak. Now, don't you think it's kind of neat that Peter's the one that stands up? Don't you think, old Pete, the one that, was the, that, that denied Jesus back there at the crucifixion, the one that cursed and said, I don't know the man, the one that Jesus said, Peter... Satan's granted permission to sift you like wheat. But he said, Peter, I'm praying for you. And he said, because I'm praying for you, when you return, strengthen your brother. In other words, you're not going to be, you're not going to be pulverized. I'm going to make sure that you're going to be okay. But he said, Peter, when, they, when you hear the cock crow, you're going to deny him three times. You're going to deny me three times and when you hear that cock crow, it's going to be a reminder. When you hear the rooster crow early in the morning, it's going to be a reminder to you. You're going to remember that you denied me. And it happened exactly like Jesus said. Peter was so broken and so hurt that when Jesus rose again, he was at the tomb and he told those of the ladies that were there, he said, go tell my disciples I'm risen. And then he added a little addendum to the end. He said, oh, yeah, don't forget to tell Peter. Don't forget to tell Peter. You know why? Because Peter was broken. Peter didn't think there was any place for him anymore. Peter was ready, probably ready to give up. He didn't even know how he would ever face Jesus. 
So Jesus made it easy for him in John 21 when he's, Peter went fishing and they're out in a boat and Jesus on the shore, they look and all they see is a silhouette in the moonlight trying to come up early in the morning. And Jesus hollers out and says, boys, have you caught any fish? They said, we toiled all night. These were fishermen. That's what they did for a living. They said, we toiled all night. Didn't catch nothing. Jesus said, how about throwing a net on the other side? And they probably said, we've been there. We fished every side of this boat. We're going to waste our time. But if he says, do it, we'll do it. How many of you know obedience is better than sacrifice? They threw the net on the other side. And the nets were so full they had to call the other boys' boats over to help them so the nets didn't break. Jesus calls them in. He doesn't say, bring a few fish out of your nets, boys. He says, I've got breakfast fixed for you. How many of you believe Jesus is probably a better fisherman than they were? This same Peter that Jesus, after he got him in that, that morning with breakfast, he said, Peter, if you love me, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. And feed my sheep. He commissioned him to be a pastor. So now Peter stands up on Pentecost 50 days later. And he says, these men aren't drunk, as you suppose, in verse 15. They're not drunk. He said, this is only the third hour. It's only 9 a.m. But this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass. In the last days. Now church, you might not believe this, but we're living in the last days. In fact, when this Holy Ghost 2,000 years ago was the beginning of the last days. Pastor, how can we figure what the last days? Well, you can look at it like this real quick. God said he worked six days and rested on the seventh. The seventh day is going to be the day of rest. Seventh day is when he's going to call his children home. Seventh day, the father's going to reach over and tap his son upon the shoulder and say, bring my children home to me. Well, Pastor, how do you know that? Well, it's been 2,000 years from the flood. From the, from the creation to the flood, it's been 2,000 years. From the flood till the uh, beginning of, 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 of the cross, it's been 2,000 years. It's been almost 2,000 years from the time Jesus resurrected till today. That's six. Anybody counting with me? Two, four, six. And then as God worked six days and rest of the seventh. And the Bible says that a, a, year, a day is 1,000 years and 1,000 years is a day in the Lord. So that means we're real close to the end of the sixth day. At the end of the sixth day, that's the reason why you hear so many people talking today. Dr. Seamer's got a revelation on we're so close to the coming of the Lord. God's coming soon, trying to get us ready. He's coming soon. He's coming soon. Amen? But the last days, this is that was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God. That I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. He's talking about the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. There he's explaining what's happened with cloven tongues of fire and what happened in the upper room. And he's explaining to all those that gathered in, in Jerusalem, he's explaining to them why this phenomenon must take place. That I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants. And my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit on those days. And they shall prophesy, and I shall, and they shall see wonders in heaven. Listen, this outpouring is for the anointing of God. This Holy Spirit outpouring is for power for us that we might be able to walk in a new dimension of God's glory and God's presence. Some people call this the second work of grace. What's the first work? Our salvation experience. This can't happen until we're born again. This can't happen until, until the Spirit of God, until God is breathed into us. Over in John 20 and verse 22, it said when Jesus, so this is right after the resurrection, he said when he had said this, 
he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, this is in John 20 and verse uh, John 20 and verse 22 and 23 uh, we say well didn't they receive the Holy Spirit then that wasn't the Holy Spirit that was their salvation experience we can't get saved without the Holy Spirit Bible says no man comes unless the Spirit draws we have a portion and when he breathed into them that's the very same word and the very same experience that happened to Adam when God breathed into Adam and gave him the breath of life he, he made it out of the clay out of the dust out of the dirt of the ground he formed a man and he breathed into him because that was, that was Holy Ghost breath that was life giving power that went into him and these disciples needed that if they was going to be born again, if they was going to know Jesus as their Savior, if they was going to be prepared for the Holy Spirit to come, they had to first have a relationship with Jesus. Is anybody with me? And he said he breathed into them. What did they do? They received. How do we know this wasn't the baptism? How do we know this wasn't the outpouring? Because he told the very same men that he breathed into in Acts 1, 8, here in Jerusalem till the Holy Ghost comes upon you that you might be witnesses in Jerusalem, Samaria, and Judea and the uttermost parts of the world. I wish I had time to finish this, but I don't. But five times in the book of Acts, it talks about the Holy Spirit. You can write them down and look it up later. They received the Holy Spirit in Acts 1, 2, 4. I just read to you the outpouring. In Acts... In Acts... 8 and 14 through 18 uh, when Philip has that great revival that uh, John and Peter and John went and said have you received the Holy Spirit uh, since you've been believed they said we've never heard of the Holy Spirit and said they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit in Acts 9 17 the Apostle Paul he just gets saved he has a revelation from Jesus as uh, God speaks to him he goes to a place he's blind he goes to a place a street called straight a man called Ananias comes and lays hands on him and he received the Holy Spirit it doesn't say he spoke in tongues but it does Paul says later I've spoken in tongues more than y'all then in Acts 19 verses 1 through 6 it talks about the, the, how they received the Holy Spirit and through the anointing and the laying on of hands in Acts chapter 10 and verse 44 it talks about they received the Holy Spirit whenever they came to them these were men that already were saved and knew the Lord what about you church if we don't have this Holy Spirit we're going to miss Pentecost Pentecost was in vain if we don't receive this baptism this anointing first thing we got to be born again unless we're born again we can't see the kingdom of heaven what does that mean there has to be a time in our life that we ask Jesus to come into our heart and save us there has to be some time in your life you don't have to remember the date you don't have to remember the day but there has to be a time that you know you had a birth experience that you were born again that you were that you had a, had, had a new birthday in Jesus Christ then after that I think every Christian needs to be empowered by the Holy Spirit church this baptism Holy Spirit the purpose of it is that we can live this life in victory we're saved we're saved so we can go to heaven we're filled with the Holy Ghost so we can live here on earth with power I went, I went one day with, I wouldn't want to go one day without it without the empowerment without the anointing if I had time, I'd take you over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and tell you that there's special giftings for those that receive the Holy Spirit. There's the gift of, of healing. And there's the gift of, to of tongues. There's the gift of interpretation. There's the gift of, uh, of, of prophecy. There's giftings that flow along with this empowerment. There's two things I want to make sure that happens this morning on Pentecost Sunday first thing is if you don't know Jesus as your own personal savior if you're lost and undone and you don't spiritually have an awakening with him today's the day of salvation now's the accepted time stay with me for just a moment stay with me church listen the greatest day in my life is when I put my hand in the nail scarred hand of Jesus and ask him to come into my heart the greatest day in my life that happened when I was a very young man. That's the reason I spoke to these young people and said, listen, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. 
Know God in the times of your youth, not when you're old. No guarantee that you're going to get old. No guarantee you're going to make it till you're 70 or 80 years old and say, well, now that I've sown my wild oats and I've done all what I can do, now I'll talk about Jesus. Today is the day of salvation. And church, listen. If you haven't received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, if you haven't allowed the Spirit of God to just overshadow you, and saturate you, and fill you, what are you waiting for? Why should anybody say, I'm not ready for that? The empowerment of life. So two things I want to ask you. First thing is, is there somebody here that would say, Pastor, I'm not sure about whether I really know Jesus like you're talking about. But I want to. And that comes because the Spirit of God may be speaking to your heart right now. What happens when you ask Jesus to come into your life? You got a home in heaven. Your name's written in the Lamb's book of life. You're guaranteed what Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I come again. You got a home that's he's waiting for you. You're part of his family. Is there anybody here right now say, Pastor, that's me? That's me. Will you pray for me? Will you let me pray with you? Ask Jesus to come into your life right now. If there's somebody here that needs to make Jesus Lord of your life, or maybe you used to walk with God, you used to be excited about the things of God, but the fire's kind of gone out, the, the joy's gone. Would you let this pastor pray for you? If that's you, I want you to raise your hand right now and say, that's me, pastor. I see that hand, sweet. Is there somebody else? Say, me too, pastor. I want to make Jesus Lord of my life. I want God to come into my heart. I'm willing to accept him as Lord and master. I'm giving you a chance right now. God is speaking to some hearts right now. And you're a little bit reluctant about raising your hand, but I'm not asking you to join a church. I'm not going to ask you to be committed to anything except for fall in love with Jesus like you never had before is there somebody is there somebody else God bless you brother somebody else say me too I believe God's working on a few people I'm just going to give it a minute God's working on you just raise your hand I'm not going to embarrass you I'm not going to ask you to do anything except for pray a prayer with me that's you raise your hand hallelujah stand with me everybody please but the elders come to the altar. We're going to pray for people to re receive the baptism in just a moment. But I like those that just raise your hand. Will you come down? Let me pray with you. You just raise your hand. You want Jesus, make him Lord of your life. Meet me right here. Hallelujah. God bless you, brother. I appreciate it. Two men are making a decision to make Jesus Lord of our life. My sister's coming down here. She wants to make a fresh commitment. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Isn't that good? It's the right decision. I love you, man. Hallelujah. Praise God. I'm going to pray a prayer. I'm going to lead you all in a prayer. Will you follow me in this prayer? You follow me in this prayer do that God will do the rest church I want you to pray with these that are coming down here say father I come to you in Jesus name I thank you Lord for touching me this morning and Lord I ask you to forgive me of my sin and Lord I thank you that you love me no matter what I confess Jesus Christ as Lord of my life and I acknowledge that God raised Christ from the dead. And Lord, according to your word, I am saved. I ask you to take over my life, live in my heart, and I make a commitment right now. I'll live for you, and I'll serve you 
And I thank you that my name right now is written in your book. And I have a home in heaven. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, I pray right now for my brother, the baptism of the Holy Spirit and impartation of the Holy Ghost. Jesus, you're the baptizer. Fill him with the Holy Spirit. Fill him with power and anointing to live this life that he's made a commitment for. Fill my brother with the Spirit of the living God. Empower him with the Holy Ghost. Lord, you're going to use this young man. You're going to, you've got something deep in his heart. He doesn't even know about it yet, but you're going to raise him to the top like cream comes to the top of the milk. God, you're going to bring him to a place where you're going to use him. And you're going to stir him down within his spirit, man. Fill him with your spirit, in Jesus' name. Lord, fill my sister with the Holy Ghost, with the, Holy, with the Spirit right now. Jesus, you're the baptizer. Baptize her in the Holy Ghost in power and anointing and freshness. I'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. If y'all will go with this couple for just a moment, you'll be back in about two or three minutes. They're going to put a Bible in your hand when you do that. Beverly, you can feel free to come and come with your friend. You probably would feel encouraged if you did. Listen, we'll be dismissed in just a moment. This is an important day. We don't have church tonight, so if we're going to take a few minutes more, it's okay. Amen? How many of you want God to move in a mighty way in people's lives? How many of you care about other people? You want God to move. Now, here's the, here's the thing. Where's my leaders at? I want my leaders to be ready. Come on down here close. How many, how many of you right here that there was... You know what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is. You've heard about it. You've heard people preach it. You've heard me preach it. But you've, re- you've never really had the experience yet of the impartation and the power of God. And you would like it. How many by the uplifted hand? And I want you to come down here and somebody's going to pray for you. You raise your hand. Come on down. You want the empowerment of the Holy Spirit with the evidence and, a, and, 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 and a, the evidence of the baptism is power there'll be things that God was going to stir up in you and it's going to bring forth some things like you haven't experienced before. If you want that, I want you to come. We're just going to take a minute or two for this. This is Pentecost Sunday. This is the time to receive empowerment. It's time to let the Holy Ghost flow. If that's you, come quickly, quickly. I want my one people here. Husbands and wives, you have to split up because I'm people to be prayed for. Mickey, why don't you go down and pray for one of these people? I don't want any delay. I want people to come and, and, and receive prayer. He'll be right here. Right, right here, Patrick. Right here. Right here. And since we separate us, other people will come to you and pray. You're waiting to receive the impartation, the baptism, the anointing. I want you to come. These leaders know how to pray for that. Remember, we're not the baptizer. Jesus is the baptizer. John the Baptist said, I baptize you with water. One is greater than I will baptize you in the Holy Ghost and fire. If you want the baptism of the Holy Spirit, of course, if you need a healing, if you need prayer for something else, come for that too. But there are some here that need, that need that. Some of you are struggling in your life every day because you don't have power. And the devil's trying to slam you. Break the devil's back right now by just receiving the Holy Spirit, the baptism. If you have a prayer language right now, I want you to pray in the Holy Spirit. I want you to pray in the Holy Ghost right now if you've got a prayer language. Rest of you, let's minister to the Lord with music, with this song.
involved. I'd like you to reach out and pray. I'd like you to pray in the Spirit. If you can, if you haven't received a prayer language, come down and get it or pray in your, pray in your understanding. When did I receive the baptism? On Pentecost Sunday. Hallelujah. Fifty days after the resurrection. Celebrates every year. the Holy Ghost move for just a moment we'll be dismissed in a few minutes let, let the Spirit of God move. the anointing of the Spirit we, we taught on the Holy Spirit and let the Holy Spirit do something hallelujah thank you Lord I'm going to ask everybody to be in unity with me. One accord. How many of you know that's important? One accord. Let's all sing this together, okay? Holy Spirit, rain down. Real simple. Let's sing it together. Rain down. Come on, church. One accord. Rain down. Can we get unity on one song? about the fullness of the Holy Ghost this is the time for you
feel the presence of the Holy Ghost. I see a cloud sitting on you right now. The cloud came down. The presence of God came down. Brother Ken Curry, come on up here and dismiss us in prayer, my brother. Sweet man, I really appreciate this man of God that's got a passion for the things of God. Brother Ken, dismiss us in prayer, will you? Saints, let's pray today. Holy Ghost, we thank you for your spirit that's here in the sanctuary. God, how that you've met with us on this Pentecost day. God, we felt the presence from early on coming into the, the pastor's office where there was prayer going up for the service. To the songs, the music, the worship, to the preaching of your word. And God, here around the altar as men and women have come to give their hearts to you and those that have come to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. We thank you for your spirit, your presence right now. Thank you, God, for this church, this congregation of people. Lord, that they are doing your work and your will in this Tampa area. And not just here, God, but around the world as those go out from this place to spread the gospel. We thank you right now. God, we give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' name, let the church say amen.